Yeah. All, all right. right. So while we're getting all mic'd up. So, you know, we, it's true. We derive pleasure from doing mathematics, but I've never really had a serious conversation with anyone about that. And this talk just represents my own personal feelings about the philosophy of the aesthetics of math. Here we go. Um, the pleasure we get from doing math, I think, is an aesthetic pleasure. It's equivalent to the pleasure you get from looking at beautiful art. You can also look at a beautiful mathematical thing and derive the same sort of pleasure, and that's why I call it aesthetic. Um, you know, what do philosophers have to say? Well, plenty, but I'm not a philosopher, but I found a quote, beauty is the pleasant which comes through the senses of hearing and sight. All that tells you is that beauty is something we get filtered through the senses. And I'm gonna add to hearing and sight some kind of mathematical eye. So what makes something beautiful in art or in math? I thought of a few things. So if you're gonna write down a list of things you find beautiful in art or in math, you might come up with like proportionality, like beautiful proportions of things in architecture or in figures, here are some easily found stock photos to prove that point. <laughs> you can overlay a, overlay a golden ratio on anything these days, you know, whenever. Um, oh, this is more interesting. Proportions. Oh, how about, you know, if I went over here, would that be better? But then am I still over here? All right, good. And then I can look here. All right, good. So this next virtue, I'm calling it economy right what picasso can deliver in just a very few strokes mathematically it's like what power in math can we deliver with very few words and i put this proof of infinitely many primes through many drafts so i could get like a very short one to any list of primes a new one can be added any prime divisor of the product plus one so easy and so we get some kind of pleasure from the economy. Um, no, 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 don't look at that one yet. Um, uh, virtuosity is another virtue I found. This is when you recognize in the creator a lot of skill and you are in awe of it. So here Bernini sculpts something, he sculpts flesh out of marble and that's really incredible to us and here ramanajan creates a beautiful identity for one over pi that makes you sit back and gasp like how did he do that how, you marvel at the skill of some other human being and that's like another aesthetic virtue um, but the virtue that we're talking about today i didn't really have a word for it going in i have examples um, here is a mosque in iran with its intricate tiles and here next to it is a fractal and the idea that i'm coming across i mean for this venue i'm calling it glamour and i will explain why i'm calling that in a moment but um you know of course the fractal is intricately detailed and very beautiful uh sorry the mosque is this way and the fractal this has an amazing property i it's a partition of the plane into three colors and the boundaries of all three of the colors are the same. And it's, um, you know, if you try to put green next to blue, some red has to intervene, but then the red touches the green, but then blue has to intervene. And I mean, just that rule I said, where you've got three colors, they all share a common boundary, forces it to be a fractal. And it's infinitely detailed, and this to me is really stunning. So this virtue that we, I find very beautiful, I'm calling it glamour. Why am I calling it that word? So my working definition of glamour is a, a pattern that's very intricately detailed that enchants you, that you know, makes you awestruck. So we see this all the time in art and in math both. Um, why this word? Well, you can follow the etymology of it to some word grammary, like magic or enchantment. And then I found multiple roots for this word, one from gram, which is like magic, you know, like a unit, like the, the unit for like magic potions. But it also might be related to the word grammar, but I think that comes from the same Greek word ultimately having to do with writing, like graph. But grammar, you know, used to just mean learning, 
or occult learning like witchcraft. So, you know, a sense of enchantment that comes from learning. That's, that's glamour. So we're just going to use glamour for this purpose. I think it's really appropriate. Um, characteristics. So if you see a pattern, uh, well, it could be symmetric, it could be orderly, obeys rules, but it's still so complex and unpredictable that when you view it, your consciousness can't really get it in all at once. You know, if that mosque just had like a checkerboard pattern all the way, that's not glamorous because that's too predictable. That's too orderly. The mosque itself has such a variation of designs that you really can't take it in all at once. You can take in this little part, you can take in this little part, but the whole thing is too big for your little mind to comprehend. Right? All right, so um, related words. Okay, you can come up with your own. Kaleidoscopic, spellbinding, fascinating, and psychedelic and trippy are all words that come to mind thinking of certain mathematical objects maybe you can relate or come up with your own words like this all right um what are we doing with this talk so my thesis was that this effect of glamour it's common it's important even though we don't talk about it and also even though i've given you visual cues the effect of glamour is not necessarily visual it can be induced by just logical or abstract objects which just live in the mathematical eye not necessarily literally your eye although i do have you know visual aids for this talk um so the rest of this talk is my own personal journey through math highlighting the glamour effect in three domains so you know i'm just going to talk about some research that i've done in the past in a kind of colloquium style and um I will talk about some algebraic geometry, some commutative algebra, and some representation theory, right? All areas of math that I really, really like. So that's what we're going to do, and I'm going to be highlighting this glamour effect throughout. So okay, there's the first part of the talk, and the rest of it is kind of the afterthought that's actually about math, so here we go. <laughs> yeah, part two, yeah, okay, <laughs> the, boring, the boring actual math begins now. <laughs> So I wanted to prompt this discussion by, um, yeah, something which is bread and butter to the algebraic geometer, so families of curves. So let's say S is a surface, smooth projective surface over an algebraically closed field, if you like, C is a curve, and I want to map between them. So that's going to be a family of curves. If you have a family of curves, some of them might be singular. In fact, that's generally what happens. And I drew one of my favorite examples of this right here. So this is called the Hesse family. It is a family of elliptic curves. So look at this equation right here. Um, in the variables x, y, and z, it's homogeneous of degree 3. And then there's this extra variable t, which is like a parameter below. So I can think of it in the four variables. It's going to be a surface inside of p2 cross p1, all right? And it projects down onto the t variable. If for a particular value of t, this is a cubic in the curve, a cubic equation in the plane, so it's an elliptic curve. So this is a family of elliptic curves. Generically, this is going to be an elliptic curve, so I drew it like this. The generic fiber of the map from S to P1 is an elliptic curve, like this donut, but then there is going to be four points where the fiber is singular. And at each of those singular points, the singularities just occur when two copies of P1 cross. So the singular fibers are all the same. They're all three copies of the projective line meeting pairwise. So those sorts of singularities are nodes. They're particularly nice. Those are the nicest kinds of singularities. So in this situation, I call it a semi-stable family. All singular points of the fibers are just nodes. Okay, any questions about this little picture? This is my favorite elliptic vibration. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, 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 because I'm lazy. What I could have done to make it right is to put T1 there and T2 there, and then it would be homogeneous in the T variables, and then separately homogeneous in the XYZ variable. And then it's just T is just shorthand for like a inhomogeneous. Yeah, okay, great. Um, all right, great. Uh, yeah, I think the, the phrase dual graphs came up earlier. In this, uh, in this conference. So I will just replace the pictures from before with this picture. 
So instead of P1s meeting pairwise, I draw a, um, a vertex to mean a copy of P1. And then two vertices meet whenever those two P1s come together. And it's going to be a, um, yeah. So in this picture, the edge means that those two P1s meet transversely. So this is a picture of a semi-stable elliptic fibration that has a family. Um, okay, so there's other fibrations. All right, so I drew, I hope this is somewhat legible. Let me know if I can explain anything further if you can't see. But another really famous family of elliptic curves is like this, y squared equals x times x minus one times x minus t. So that's in Weierstrass form. So you get a elliptic curve as long as this thing on the right has no double, double roots, but there will be double roots when t is either zero or one, and you also get a bad fiber at infinity. And the bad fiber at infinity is not semi-stable. So you get this picture like this. So, I mean, you have to do Tate's algorithm to get a smooth surface. But anyway, the fiber over infinity has multiple components. So those little twos mean that the P1 exists with multiplicity. So this is not a semi-stable vibration. But if you like semi-stable vibrations, and I do, you can pass to a double cover of the base. You can make a substitution to make it semi-stable. And the substitution in this case is t is equal to s squared. So that turns this vibration into one where the t has been replaced with s squared. So let's see the effect this has on fibers. So if the bad fibers were at zero, one, and infinity up here, that means that the bad fiber fibers in the s variable will be like the square roots of these numbers. So zero, one, and minus one in infinity. And that was, un, you know, this t equals s squared, it's unramified over one, so the picture didn't change there. But the, the, the fiber at zero changed, the two vertices became four, and the fiber at infinity changed, also became four. And now looking at this picture, it actually is semi-stable. So the story, the lesson of this slide is that if you have a family of curves over a base, if it's not semi-stable, you can pass to a branched cover of the base so that it becomes semi-stable. This is a general principle. Are there any questions on this slide? Okay. Um, well, then the next slide is like, well, what do number theorists do? Well, number theory is like algebraic geometry, but your base is like a ring of integers, like just maybe the integers. So I came up with an example that's very much like this, where the picture is like basically the same. I replaced t with one third. This time the base is spec z, right? Um, so spec z has many primes in it, but one of them is three. And so three acts like infinity did before, and the fiber looks like this. And by the way, if you delete one of those points, that's, that's a Dinkin diagram, and that's not an accident. Like elliptic vibrations, the bad fibers all look like um, extended Dinkin diagrams, which is very cool, of type A, D, E. Anyway, this is like D, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, great. So um, after passing to a branched cover of the base that is an extension, you can add the square root of three. And then what happens is that this unstable figure becomes a stable one, where just P1s are meeting transversely again. So this is a nice kind of reduction. I mean, you can, we can talk about the reasons why semi-stable reduction is like the best. But the thing is like, that's as good as you can do. You can keep on, you can add whatever algebraic numbers you want. You're never going to like make this figure anything, like it won't ever get achieve good reduction. There's only multiplicative reduction is the best you can do. Okay. All right. The theme is if you have a curve over a z, you can come, you can pass to the ring of integers and in some algebraic extension, and then your curve becomes semi-stable. It can always be done. So uh, very good. Okay, very good. Um, so I want to do this not with just some elliptic curve, but with a really important family of curves. The modular curves. So, I mean, if you're into um, modular forms, then you should be into modular curves all the same. So, if P, let's fix P to be an odd prime number, okay? So, uh, the modular curve X of 1 is what the number theorists call M11. That's curves of genus 1 with one marked point. Those are elliptic curves. So, the moduli space X of 1. Maybe by itself, that's not so interesting. It's just like the, just P1. It's a rational curve. But you can form this tower of curves over it by also classifying 
elliptic curve with a basis for E of P to the N. So this means the torsion. So the torsion in an elliptic curve, like the P to the N torsion, is two copies of the group Z mod P to the N. So um, a basis for that Z mod P to the N module, if you fix one of those, that's a, a like gamma of P to the N structure, you call it. And there's a curve which classifies all of them. You can make that curve over the complex numbers or Q bar, but you can also make it over Z one over P. Um, there might be problem at P because like if E is in characteristic P, then it's P to the N torsion is no longer as I described it. However, it is possible to extend X of P to the N in some natural way to a family of curves over spec Z, including the prime P. It's just that when you do that, the curve X of P to the N has really bad reduction at the prime P. Um, so I'm, I'm referring here to the Katz Maser book um, that describes lots of different kinds of modular curves. Um, all right, so we have a family of curves X of P to the N to spec Z. I want you to think of it as a surface fibered over a curve, like spec Z is a curve. Um, it has non-singular fibers at all primes except for P, but at P it is very singular. Questions so far? Okay. Um, all right, so this is the picture that appears in the Katz Maser book for lots of elliptic curves. Uh, for a modular curve X of P to the N, you reduce it mod P and you get a highly singular curve with many components. So the irreducible components are all known. They're known as Agusa curves. And they all cross at what's known as the super singular locus. So I won't really explain all of those ideas, but if you're familiar with how um, the elliptic curves behave modulo P, you know that there's two kinds of reduction. There's ordinary and super singular, corresponding to the behavior of the P torsion in the elliptic curve. And so that explains why you get the different behaviors at the ordinary locus and the super singular locus. Lots of singularities there. Um, question. So if you were to make a sufficiently ramified extension of the integers, then you can play this game of looking for a semi-stable curve. So replace spec Z with something really ramified at P. And then X of P to the N admits some semi-stable model and you want to know like what the special fiber of that is. So like in those pictures before, where after passing to some ramified base extension, you see semi-stable reduction. What is the semi-stable reduction of the modular curve? And so this question was posed to me by Robert Coleman while I was a grad school in the mid 2000s. And um, he had done some work with some co-authors about this for certain cases, like when n is small but it wasn't really clear yet what the answer would be for n large. And so, yeah, I mean, I consider this problem for basically, I mean, from conception to publication, it was about 10 years and it was really a long, strange trip that I'm gonna like take you through right now. So here we go. <laughs> the question is, what is this gamma n? So, um, and are there any questions about like the general goal here? Like I wanna know what this gamma n is, it's a graph the vertices are, should be labeled by curves, modulo P. All right, so the question was, what is that semi-stable curve gamma N? So after thinking about the problem for years, I realized that it becomes tractable. It's like sort of impossible to say what it is just for any particular value of N. But somehow when you pass to this like inverse limit, the question becomes tractable again, and you get a lot of symmetries in play. So, all right, so maybe we can try to describe instead of this graph gamma n, we can describe um, some kind of limit of them, but like a projective limit. You know, if you layer these modular curves on top of each other, they form a projective limit. Each one maps towards the one that's less complicated. The limit would be sequences of points which are compatible with respect to all the transition maps. So it is possible to find a compatible system of semi-stable models for this limit X of P to the infinity over ZP bar. Then it makes sense to form an inverse limit of these curves, gamma N. 
And then I could try to describe what gamma infinity is. And I'm going to ignore that pedantic note. OK. Um, the next few slides attempt to convey the, the structure of this gamma infinity. So what I'm going to give you now is the structure of, um, I'll, I'll write down what the dual graph is. So each vertex corresponds to a curve modulo p. So here is a picture of part of gamma infinity. It's an infinite graph of degree, I think it should be always well, for these blue vertices, always p plus one. So I guess p is three in this picture. But it's supposed to go on infinitely far. There are blue vertices with this curve. This curve was, I, I think Drinfeld wrote about this curve in one of his papers. Modulo p, it's very interesting. And then the black curves are all copies of p1. Except that in this situation, each node, it doesn't actually represent this curve, but rather the perfection of it. You have to adjoin all p power roots of all variables. That's what happened in this inverse limit. Very interesting. Um, but this wasn't the whole picture. I mean, this pattern isn't very glamorous by itself. <laughs> OK, I'm calling the rest of the components wild. Imagine the previous slide on its side, right? OK, and then growing out of this are some green components, and then growing out of a black or some red components, but then there's an alternating red black pattern, right? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> right. But there's only four isomorphism classes of curves which appear, which have these equations. Why those four? <laughs> it's a tough question. And by the way, in characteristic two, you get other, you get other isomorphism classes of curves which appear. Um, so great, we've got our tame components on the floor, all wild components are sprouting up, and if I were to display them all at once, it would look something like this, so we have this, yes, yes, okay. So this is supposed to be going on, this is supposed to be a fractal, it's supposed to be a graph that goes on forever, I mean the pattern is a blue touches a green, and then it's green forever, and then a black touches a red, and then a black, and then a red, and a black, and it alternates like that. So that's that picture. So. It took a while to find this picture, but then I was like so in love with the story, I like couldn't stop. I knew that I would be studying objects like this for years and years and years, and that they would never, I mean, like objects like this would never stop, um, you know, fascinating me because I was glamorized by them. I mean, that is the effect of, of glamour. That's what it does to you. I would, you know, um, yeah. So, I mean, okay, yeah, I guess we're like almost at the end of part two. Are there any questions so far? Hi. Um, so, is it a coincidence that these kind of look like singular and Artin Schreier curves? Is it, is it a coincidence that these look like super singular and Artin Schreier curves? No, it's not a coincidence. So I think you're looking over here at y to the p minus y equals x squared. So that's an example of an Art and Schreier cover. And that's a really good way of coming up with curves that have an action of a group like of order p. Like y could go to y plus 1 in because we're in characteristic p. Why don't the Art and Schreier get more to show up? The Art and Schreier VIT ones. Ooh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So I think part one of your question was like, well, why didn't the curve show up where it was like y to the p to the n minus y? Because then you have an action of cp to the n. And it would if you made the setup of the problem different then you would see that curve appearing. That would be, but not in the modular curves, it's just that. All right, further justification for why it was this curves may appear later in the talk, and we can certainly talk about it, but yeah, but it's a good question. What is it? Correct. Okay, why did the, okay, so that was in the situation of an elliptic vibration. Um, when you apply Tate's algorithm to a Weierstrass equation, the output of that is one of these Dinkin diagrams. What is a good source for that? Um, 
Silver, but Silverman 2, right? Silverman 2 has all the information. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So since like, okay. So how did I arrive at this picture? What the hell is going on here? So we now turn to like the algebra portion of the talk. So this is a talk that has to do with perfectoid spaces. So it turns out that this inverse limit that we're talking about is an example of one. So I mean, so Coleman posed this problem to me in the mid 2000s, perfectoid spaces had not yet been invented. And I was thinking and thinking and thinking and just kind of working with this sort of limit formally. But then Schulze came around and proved something like, oh yeah, there's a category containing such things. It's called perfectoid spaces. So part of this project was learning about those and applying techniques from that world. So I'm gonna try to communicate like something about what perfectoid spaces are and still try to communicate the fact that even though you can't like see them really, they're still glamorous, <laughs> I guess, in the sense that they have this kind of effect on me. They are infinitely richly detailed. It's hard to just comprehend one of them entire in its entirety. So let's talk about that. Um, all right, this is like one of my favorite examples from topology. So since we're considering inverse limits of towers, let's do it with a topological space. Like, let's just start with S1, the circle. I want to model that on complex numbers of absolute value one. And this inverse limit would mean like, okay, all sequences of complex numbers where the first one has absolute value one and you choose a p root and a p square root and, and so forth. So p can still be a prime number. So that's interesting. I mean, it maps towards S1, but um, the fibers of that map, it's like, well, each time you choose a p root, you have p options and then p squared more, first p squared options and then p cubed options. So really like the fibers above each point of the circle is like an actual ZP, like the p-adic numbers. So that's interesting. And then if you want like a quick way of just writing down what this thing is, it's ZP cross R modulo Z. <laughs> Although it's hard for me to stare at this and actually have some picture of what the thing is. Um, I stole this from Wikipedia. So if you look at, if you, if you um, look up what a solenoid is mathematically, it's something like this. So there is a way to take this X as a topological space and embed it as a closed subset of R3. It's interesting. There's, it's an intersection of a bunch of closed subsets. One of them is a solid torus. And then take that same solid torus, wrap it inside itself P times. Then you get a smaller coiled up torus. And then wrap that same thing inside of itself P squared times to get an even smaller, even more wrapped up torus. I've just now described a sequence of nested closed subsets of R3. Take the intersection, it's like this thing. That's homeomorphic to this X. It's a really good counterexample in topology because it's connected, but it's not locally connected or path connected. Like to get from this point to this point, there's too much line for you, like for you to get there. <laughs> it's too far. You just can't get from A to B with just R. It's not going to work. And it's not even locally connected. So each, um, each open subset of a particular point is very disconnected. So it's not even locally connected, sort of like the set of connected components of each open subset around a point would be like a Cantor set. Okay, so that's kind of like a warm up. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, fortune favors the bold. Right? All right, so if I actually want to write down a perfectoid space for you, we need some like we need to work over some base and I chose for my base something like the complex numbers, but the complex numbers in the piatic world. So here we go, the world of piatic geometry, here it is. Take Q, complete it piatically, you get QP, the field of piatic numbers, okay. Um, QP is like the real numbers and it's, you know, it, that's the analogy. And if you took the algebraic closure of QP, you get some bigger field. But that field is not complete. You have to complete it to get something like the complex numbers. So I'm going to call that CP. So it's a complete algebraically closed field, and you can do analysis to it. Great. So 
QP and CP have an absolute value on them. So um, that makes it like a complete metric field. And if I look at, and that is our non-Archimedean absolute value. So I can look at um, all of the uh, elements of absolute value less than or equal to one. So that's uh, the ring of integers. So I call that OCP. Okay. So yeah, you know, so uh, <laughs> it's a non-Ethereum ring. <laughs> so it's maximal ideal. You square it, you get the maximal ideal again. Uh. Okay, so I mean, you can consider a chain of maximal ideals that will not satisfy the ascending chain property. A non ethereum local ring, you know, it's, <laughs> if you object to this, you know, to the door is that way. <laughs> you have to learn to love non ethereum rings to get into this business. So I'll just sketch out the definition of a perfectoid space over CP. Perfectoid spaces have some commonalities with the solenoid that I just talked about. They're certainly built out of non ethereum rings, though. So um, in algebraic geometry, we build schemes out of the spectra of rings. So if I have a commutative ring, I can take its spec. So that's the set of prime ideals, and that's going to be a uh, a topological space with a sheaf of rings on it. And if you glue a bunch of those together, I get a scheme, right? Um, what's a perfectoid space? Well, they're built similarly out of units that come from rings. But in this case, the rings are a special kind of ring called the perfectoid ring. And we're gluing together attic spectra, not spectra, but attic spectra. So what does that mean? So spa or attic spectrum, I mean, that's like, attic spectrum, that's what SPA means. Uh, that's the set of continuous valuations. I'm not gonna define that rigorously, but it's like the set of absolute values on a ring that obeys certain axioms. So the thing to explain then is like, what are these perfectoid rings? I mean, the word perfect is in there indicating like perfect of characteristic P, like raising to the P's power is an isomorphism. So keep that in mind. This is a this is a variation on that theme. Um, all right, trying to build this up in stages here. So let's construct a pianic analog for the solenoid that we talked about before. So I mean, in algebraic geometry, what plays the role of this circle, S1? How about the multiplicative group? It's like, you know, affine line minus a point. So, okay, so we're familiar with this, I hope. Like GM is the multiplicative group. So take the ring CP adjoint X and X inverse, and the spectrum of this is a multiplicative group scheme. So it's a scheme, certainly, it's an affine scheme, but it's also a group. Like this is a Hopf algebra, it has a co-multiplication on it, and the group law is just multiplication. So to pass from this to the solenoid, what you should do is take the limit of the GMs. So on the side of rings, that's kind of like taking X and adjoining all piece roots of it. So the functions on the solenoid would be like X and X inverse, but you're supposed to take P powers of everything. So such a thing would be a function on the solenoid. So a good guess for what the solenoid in the algebraic world should be, should be this thing. And this works pretty well. I mean, this ring is still a hop algebra. Um, better yet, like, multiplication by p on the solenoid is an isomorphism like you can undo it multiplication by p just shifts everything around so um co-multiplication by p is an isomorphism on the half algebra so the last thing in this paragraph is that this s it's not just a group scheme it's a commutative group scheme but with an action of one over p so it's like a you could call it a group scheme that's p divisible a p divisible group scheme or you could call it a Z1 over P module scheme. Okay, so is this a perfectoid space? No, sorry, not yet. <laughs> but at least we got an idea that we had to adjoin lots of P's roots of things. Okay, I really agonized over how to like make this slide, but I, this is just what I landed on, okay. Time for some hand waving. All right, <laughs> but you have the idea. We're supposed to adjoin lots of P's roots. So to get a perfectoid ring, it's not enough to just use this polynomial setup. You have to use power series. So instead, I'm going to talk about power series over the ring of integers. But it's power series in one variable. 
and the variable is allowed to have all piece power roots. So it's power series where the coefficients live in OCP, and T is allowed to have any piece root it wants. Okay. So this, sim this situation is actually similar to this one. And you can actually derive the situation from this one. You can take this solenoid and complete it at its origin to get this. This is the formal solenoid over OCP. So, um, so this too is a Hopf algebra. In fact, it's like um, a topological Hopf algebra because this A has a topology. Uh, so there's a co-multiplication map from A to A tensor A, all that's fine. But it's even better than that. Just like this was a, you know, multiplication by P is an isomorphism. Same here, but you actually get co-multiplication by the field QP. Not just Z1 over P, but QP. So the spectrum of this ring, it's not just a, com not just a commutative group scheme. It's a QP vector space scheme. So I would call this thing a formal vector space of dimension one over QP. Um, Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, so this ring is what's known as a perfectoid algebra. So what is the property of being a perfectoid algebra? There are a few other axioms, but the most important one is the following one. First of all, it's, you know, it lives over OCP. It's an OCP algebra. I can mod out by P to get something in characteristic P. I can also mod out by a P root of P because OCP contains such a thing. And P is also zero in this ring. And there's a map from this to this, given by just the piece power map, right? And um, this is an isomorphism. So it's easy to check this for this very simple ring. But this is what tells you whether you are a perfectoid algebra. If the piece power map from A modulo P to the one over P to A modulo P is an isomorphism. So much comes from that axiom. It kind of means you can take a piece root of anything modulo P anyway. Like, for instance, the element T lives here. You can take a piece root of it modulo P, but then you could take a piece root of that modulo P and a piece root of that and so on. So no perfectoid algebra is going to be particularly easy to describe unless it's this simple. And this is just the case of the perfectoid unit ball. Um, OK, so if that's a perfectoid ring, what's a perfectoid space? Well, here come these continuous valuations again. So the space is going to be, be, you know, a set of points. The points are supposed to be valuations. So they're valuations on the ring A. You know, they have to decide how big T is and how big everything in here is. And I want them to extend the usual absolute value on OCP. So that's what this spa A is supposed to mean. And that thing is the perfectoid space. All right. Well. Okay, um, why, why didn't I just do spec A? Well, it's a whole thing. We can talk about it later. But this is supposed to be something analytic, which is more in the realm of tropical geometry, Berkovich spaces, rigid analytic spaces. It's analytic. So this thing is a perfectoid space over CP. That is a kind of attic space. What is an attic space? It is a topological space with a sheaf of Banach CP algebras. So just like a scheme was a topological space with a sheaf of rings, a perfectoid space is a kind of topological space with a sheaf of Banach algebras on it. So the, um, it's a sheaf of topological rings of a certain sort. Okay. Can you picture it? Well, I found a really great image yesterday. <laughs> I found a preprint by someone named Wang Peng. And I love this picture because in my mind, I know something like this is happening, but I've never seen it done so beautifully as this. Oh my goodness. So um, as with tropical geometry, there are lots of like combinatorial things happening. Like there are all these rays, but what distinguishes this from tropical geometry is the branching. When you move from one point to another in this topological space, you have the option of branching at every point. So at every point on the line segment, you are allowed to go in another direction. That's kind of weird. But also, is it not a little bit glamorous? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, well, I also have to spoil the party by saying that this topological space is not Hausdorff, but you're in algebraic geometry, so maybe you like that. I don't know, but there are generic points. Every time you branch, the generic point tells you like which directions you could branch into. Look, it took me like five years to understand anything about this picture. So can't really get it across in one slide. Okay. Okay. So what was our goal today? We, we, we wanted to construct a semi-stable model for this X of P to the N thing. So that was what I was researching. So we're over OCP, okay. And the problem was that modulo P, this curve was highly singular. Like it had many components meeting in some horrible way. So fine, what are the nature of those singularities? So you can encapsulate the nature of those singularities by taking a completion. So in the study of singular varieties, you want to know just, just what's going on very close to the singularity. That's very helpful. So you might as well just complete at the singularity. That's what we're doing here. Take the curve x of p to the n, take a super singular point on a special fiber of it, and complete to get a complete local ring. So I do this at the stage n to get a sub n. And the singularity there is kind of encapsulated by this a sub n. So a sub n, or it's spectrum, or maybe it's formal spectrum, that's known as Lubin Tate space. And the algebraic topologists really like it to construct their homotopy, their chromatic homotopy theories. But yeah, yeah, but number theorists like it too, because there are links with the local Langlands program. Problem. So A0 is great, it's just a power series ring, but AN, it's basically impossible to find nice generators and relations for it. Not explicitly. Like, so, I mean, even though you can go ahead and create this ring, what good is it if you can't like figure out what it is, like how to write it down? Yeah. But again, passing to infinity actually helped in this project. So instead of just figuring out any one particular a n, which has to do with one singularity of one curve, why not just mash them all together? So in other words, consider the tower of singularities and consider the functions in a neighborhood of that one big infinite singularity. So take the union of all of those rings and then complete to get a new complete local ring, not an Ethereum, but still one maximal ideal. All right, so my next result has to do with what this ring is. All right, so I wrote it up in my um, Invenciones paper in 2016, but then I wrote up like another version of it uh, for my Arizona Winter School project in 2013. That's this presentation, which I thought was really um, elegant. So instead of power series in one variable, it's two variables, an X and a Y. So, but you're allowed to take piece roots of any of them. So two variables, but then one relation, but it's like a perfectoid relation. I want to mod out by a certain infinitely generated ideal. That ideal has generators delta to the one over p to the n minus zeta sub p to the n. So that's a primitive p to the nth root of unity. And so the, what's this delta here? So the delta is supposed to be an element of this ring, and I found it to be some expression Expression, oh God, what's going on here? Well, to take it apart, first of all, notice this L of X is a power series like this. It's a sum over all integers, both positive and negative. So T gets raised to fractional powers of P here. So expressions like this come up because if you replace T with T to the P squared, you change variables and then a P comes out. So that is useful. Um, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> One miraculous thing is that this delta is actually integral. I mean, this L has P's in its denominator, but once you exponentiate it, it actually becomes integral. This is similar to what happens with something called the artin hasse exponential function. Anyway. Um, okay, so this to me is this, uh, also has this kind of spellbinding effect on me in the same way that the picture of the modular curve did. Like, okay, this is a formula for the singularity of the modular curve. It's a perfectoid curve. One equation in two variables, except that equation 
is very difficult to write down. I mean, I just did, but if you try to write down its coefficients, there is no pattern. It's really hard to do. And yet this somehow encap this equation encapsulates the entire, you know, all of those pictures I showed you before, they're all in there somehow. All of those equations for those curves mod p are lurking in here somewhere if you just explore it enough. So I found this whole thing very thrilling. A infinity, yeah, this is a perfectoid ring. You can easily check that this pth power map is an isomorphism. Wonderful. So if you have a perfectoid ring, you can pass to the corresponding perfectoid space by considering this set of continuous valuations. Just some notes of this. This M infinity has an action of a really large group, SL2QP. Maybe that makes some sort of sense. This delta is like a determinant. The action of this is going to be some kind of linear substitutions here that preserves the determinant. Okay. Uh, and then also M infinity has an action of a quaternion group because of course it does. Because there's a quaternion group lying in the background here somewhere. I'm not going to say anything further of it. Um, the calculation of gamma infinity that I did was done using this formula. Like I started here. So basically this result came first. Uh, and this graph gamma infinity that I displayed for you, there's really a map from M infinity, well, you have to delete some points, to this, this graph. So there's a kind of like um, retraction from this very complicated, infinitely branched thing to this simpler gamma infinity thing, which is the graph. All right, um, I think that ends the part this part three. Are there any questions on it before the final part? Hi. Hey. Sorry, since you're mapping the modular curve, is this is this Lubin Tate space at height two? This is. This is Lubin Tate space at height two. So you're curious about Lubin Tate space at any height, and yes, there is a corresponding formula. You would have to do n variables, and then your Delta would be a function of n variables there with a very similar formula. Yeah. So, yeah. So, since you asked, I mean, I'm really very fascinated by spaces like this. Um, the inputs to those spaces, uh, you can change them and get other perfectoid spaces out. But then sometimes you don't get perfectoid spaces. You get these things called diamonds, another invention of Peter Schulze. And diamonds are very glamorous too. <laughs> but I will not be talking about them. Okay, others? All right, let's move to the last part. Okay, <laughs> Langlands program. Well, a lot of my motivation has to do with the Langlands program, but I, I promise I'm not gonna say that much about it. <laughs> so this, this space M infinity did have an action of a large group. You can make the setup different to get this full reductive group GL2QP. Um, and since GL2QP acts on this geometric object, it also acts on the cohomology, this H1. So M infinity is a curve, so we expect its, M, its H1 should be very interesting. So since we're talking about representations of the group GL2QP, um, well, that puts us into the realm of the Langlands correspondence, which kind of is a lot of my motivation. So the Langlands correspondence was already known for GL2 by various authors, uh, but I'll just review it here quickly. There's a bijection between irreducible representations pi of this group and other sorts of objects which really don't seem related. They're Galois representations. They're representations of the Galois group into GL2. And I mean, again, I mean, the existence of such a bijection is again, this kind of interior spellbinding. It's not, um, it's not visual, but you can see that these two very sorts of complicated objects have to pair off in some very mysterious way that I find alluring. Um, so if we look at the cohomology of infinite level Lubin-Tate space, this thing I called M infinity, it has an action of both groups. So you might want to study how does the representation theory play out in that cohomology. And then there's a theorem of Deline-Carayol 
which says that this H1 realizes the local Langlands correspondence in the sense that if you study it, it breaks up into some ands, and some of those some ands are of this form. You take a pi and you take a phi, they correspond, and their tensor product is found inside of this H1. So the geometry is like an in between, but it, it's like a mediary between the representation theory of the group GL2 and the representation theory of the Galois group. So great. Uh, this does highly relate to the work on semi-stable reduction because the cohomology of H1 um, can be computed just using this dual, this dual graph gamma infinity. And in fact, everything I'm presenting is backwards from how I discovered it. Like I needed this theorem to guess what gamma infinity was in the first place, and then I could go look for and confirm my predictions by playing with equations. Um, regarding these fees, so the representations of a Galois group, if P is odd, two-dimensional ones are easy to describe. They're all inductions. They're like monomial. They're induced from a one-dimensional character of something of index two. So I have like, like you have to pick a two, you have to pick a um, quadratic extension K over QP, and then a theta, which is a representation of that Galois group, and then this induced representation gives you the Galois representation. So the pi's which correspond to these phi's, they can be described in this way. So then when it comes to this dual graph gamma infinity, um, well, I can give you a picture like this. So this was the complete, you know, well, it was sort of a cutaway graph. So I just showed there's three different kinds of colored vertices. So one of them is like the tame part, and that corresponds to those Galois representations where k0 is unramified and theta is tame. So its, it's image has order not divisible by p. And then these green ones correspond to certain wild representations you get, but still using k0. And the farther away you are from the, this blue vertex, like the deep, more deeply ramified this theta is. And then similarly with the red, except we're using the, uh, the ramified quadratic extensions. You see there are three, if P is odd, there are three different quadratic extensions of QP and all the different representations you see kind of appear here somewhere. And so that's what I'm calling this picture. This is the geography of local Langlands. It's a way to visualize the local Langlands correspondence in geometry. So this whole picture to me is very alluring and I, there's just no end of things to study in it. So here we are. Okay. Um, we have one more slide. Are there any questions on this, on this stuff? All right, good, good. Okay, so good. The last slide. <laughs> Parting questions. The things I want you to think about. So um, basically this talk is like the beginning of a discussion that I've basically never formally had with anyone else. What are the aesthetics of math? How do we talk about them seriously? Let's cut the BS. We're here because it feels good, you know? Like we're, that's the reason. So what is it about doing math that gives us pleasure? How do we talk about the kinds of aesthetics of math? Um, why, why does it make us feel good the same way that art or music or architecture might? And then this other question, how can understanding the aesthetics of math make us better mathematicians? How can it make us choose research projects, write better papers, communicate better, and be better educators? That's something I'm really interested in too. I mean, math is kind of supposed to be fun, right? Why, oh, this one really is, I, I have no idea about the answer to this question. Why does the most useful or powerful math often seem like it is often the most beautiful. A formula that you find beautiful is often a very useful formula. And conversely, no one has any use for a really ugly formula. I mean, you might, but I feel like the general sense is that beautiful and powerful are related. Okay. And then this last question, I would just love to talk about more. Our perception of beauty in the arts is highly related to this very loaded thing called taste. You, you know, do you have good taste? 
how do you broadcast that taste into the world? You want to be seen as someone with good taste, right? And then as you go into the world as a mathematician, you also want to be seen as someone with good taste. But taste is not quite the same thing as beauty itself. You, you know, as Plato said, beauty is simply pleasure coming into your mind through your senses. So beauty is one thing, it's like pure, and then taste has to do with what, you know, trends, um, fashion, important people doing stuff that you want to emulate, what you think is going to get you the next job or the next grant, and then also just formative experiences that you might have had. All of these things inform your sense of taste. So, you know, how, is that how does that affect your perception of beauty? All right, so with that, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this talk. I hope we can talk more. Thank <laughs> you.